So um, thank you all for being here. Thanks uh, uh, to both the speakers we invited. Uh, we'll have time to present them probably in a few seconds. Um, Think Open Roberto Symposium 2021-02. Um, uh, the very first one we had it in June, and it was related to the relationship between the open science movement and uh, the uh, clinical practices that was dedicated to, especially to the local community, uh, trying to see whether we could uh, establish a connection between uh, uh, what we are doing at CIMAC and uh, people doing clinical uh, research and clinical activities in the uh, in Trentino and in Italy. Uh, this um, new symposium, uh, which is, uh, uh, whose name is uh, Power Analysis for Neuroimaging, it, it may seem to be something more related to uh, methodological questions and so on, and it is in fact, but the point here is to uh, try to trigger uh, open science uh, practices, for example, pre-registration uh, by trying to uh, say something uh, relevant uh, and new about a specific part of the uh, pre-registration story. Um, we will uh, start with um, a talk by uh, Dr. Frockebeyer from uh, Leipzig in Germany. Um, and then we will have another talk by Cameron Hellis uh, from Haskins Laboratories, New Haven, USA. Uh, we will have short question and answer sessions after each talk, and then uh, we'll try to uh, set a generic discussion up at the end of uh, both uh, the talks. Um, very quick uh, um, housekeeping uh, stuff, first of all, I want to thank uh, the staff behind uh, uh, this uh, event, uh, two PhD students, Enrico Pierotti, Gabriele Morosino, which are uh, uh, currently helping in admitting people from the waiting room. Uh, I want to thank the CIMEC IT office, um, who's uh, uh, dealing with the technical setup. Uh, CIMEC administration office, uh, who um, actually curated all the paperwork uh, with uh, the speakers themselves. Um, I introduced this talk as a part of the Think Open Ch at CIMEC uh, um, symposium cycle, uh, but uh, there is also uh, another logo you can see here is the Italia Reproducibility Network. It's a new initiative um, that uh, was born this year and is a sort of uh, uh, network which is trying to um, connect uh, people interested in open science all over uh, uh, Italy. Um, if you want to ask a question, you could use the raise your hand Zoom feature. You can write a question in the public chat. If you do not want to appear on the screen, you just mark your question, question star star, and write down your question. In any case, we will always ask you whether you are comfortable appearing on the screen before uh, asking you uh, to activate your mic or your video. Uh, please use the chat only for question or relevant contribution, for example, uh, sharing paper, links, and so on and so forth. If you need a certificate of attendance, just send an email to thinkopen.chimac at unitn.it. I will put this message in the chat as well. It's subject certificate of attendance. We'll send you a certificate in a few days. Uh, I think uh, we could start. I will stop sharing my screen and I'll ask Frauke to share um her screen as well and yes <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah. Frau Bayer got a phd at max planck institute for human cognitive and brain sciences in leipzig uh, as part of the omega lab with uh, dr veronica witte uh, with a thesis whose title was body mass index relates to brain structure and function a population-based neuroimaging approach uh, currently, Frauke works as a postdoc in the same lab, and actively participates in disseminating open science practices. Uh, I have to say that, uh, um, apart of all the thanks that I already said, um, I specifically want to thank the Brain Up community, community um, because I attended a talk by Frauke, I think, uh, uh, this June, 
it was not specifically the brain community, it was uh, the human brain mapping uh, open science room. Uh, and I found uh, her talk uh, uh, outstanding, uh, so I think uh, you would enjoy it uh, as well. Uh, Frauke, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation, actually. So I was really happy <laughs> to be asked here. And yeah, thanks also for the nice introduction. Um, I would only add that, um, um, as you said, disseminating open science practices, and actually at our institute, we have an open science initiative. You can see the logo up here on the left upper corner. And yeah, there we're working on, on a lot of these topics, actually. Um, so for my talk, um, I, which is entitled No More Blobs and Dead Fish, so a bit of a mockery title, but I actually want to talk about um, how to improve reproducibility of fMRI studies by using pre-registration and um, power analysis. And uh, throughout my talk, I, I have added a few interactive elements um, whenever you see um, the symbol of this direct poll. Um, you will be asked a question and we can look at the results together and kind of have that also for discussion a bit. And to access this poll, um, you can either use this QR code or use this um, link in your browser. Um, yeah, and I would just um, wait five seconds for you to, to get there. Um, and yeah, what you, what you would see there is um, not much yet. Um, yeah, and um, when once once the first question comes up, you will you will see um, some possibilities for answering. Um, okay, so I can. Uh, yeah, I hope it works more or less for everybody, and then <laughs> I would just start. Um, so actually, we can go directly into the first question, um, which is, do you think that it's actually possible to see, to see into the future? <laughs> so um, yeah, let's see that some people participate here. Okay, we have a race between possibly and... <laughs> yeah, nice, okay. Okay, <laughs> still votes are ongoing, but I will start. I will start talking a bit, maybe spoiling a bit, actually. <laughs> so, um, actually, there was in in the in the beginning of the 2010s, there was um, a set of studies or a discussion came up again regarding regarding psi, which refers to actually um, information processing that doesn't respect the rules of space and time. So. In a way, um, this means seeing into the future. And in this experiment, um, there were in the study there were nine experiments with around one thousand participants. Where actually um, usual normal priming, priming experiments were performed, and people were um, primed in a reversed order, in a time reversed order. So they first had to reply, and then and then they gave their um, and then they gave their uh, then they were primed actually and. Um, in these nine experiments, what was actually found was that there was a mean effect size of 0 0.2. And um, also, I think eight out of nine experiments yielded significant results. And so this would go actually, this would support the view of our voters here that uh, who say that quite possibly uh, one could see into the future. Um, but this also sparked a large dis discussion again in the psychology field. and. Then there was a replication study, which was also published um, a year later, where they included um, around 3,000 participants in seven experiments and actually um, failed to replicate any of the psi uh, premonition um, results that were previously published with an average effect size of around um, 0 0.04, which was not different from zero. And um, I think this is a very yeah interesting example of the um, replication crisis in psychology that you probably have all heard of and that was um, uh, assessed by the open science collaboration in 2015 and here what they showed was um, that when 97 percent of original studies had significant results 
only 38% of these studies replicated. Um, so here we see the original p-values and then the p-values of the replications and also the mean effect size um, of the replication study was around 0.5 um, of that of the original study. And now we could say, okay, psychology, yeah. uh, why, why, is, why, is that, why is that the case? And here I thought it, it's nice to look into the research cycle, which basically describes our way from generating hypotheses over designing studies, um, conducting studies, and then analyzing data to come up with certain results. And actually there are pitfalls in the cycle at, at each stage um, that lead to that lead to low replicability of, um, or contribute to this reproducibility crisis. Um, and um, what is, so what about neuroimaging, one could ask. And um, here I would also um, like to point you to the next question, um, just to get an overview of the audience to see what kind of data you're actually um, working with mostly. So just to, to get a feeling, um, because maybe you say, okay, it's not a problem in my field, um, because in the eye tracking studies, <laughs> it doesn't matter also. Um, but yeah, I see that actually most of you um, are actually working with fMI data. So that's cool. That's nice. So it's, it's uh, um, good. And in neuroimaging, of course, um, reproducibility is also an issue. And um, I just highlight three points. So, so one is that there's yeah, a large propensity of false positive findings, which has been highlighted in the papers by Eklund, um, showing that family-wise error rate is um, often for when using random field theory exceeding the five percent. Um, another aspect is that there's undisclosed flexibility in data processing and also analysis. Um, and finally, what, what should be a bit the topic of today is that usually neuroimaging studies have quite low power to detect true effects. And um, I will come back to that in a, in a bit, but just to show you the figure from Button 2013, where they showed that um, yeah, the power of, of neuroimaging studies is, is, really rather, is really rather low. Um, regarding the high amount of false positive findings. Um, so here, here comes, <laughs> yeah, I come back to my title. Um, in this, um, this poster that was presented at the OHBM in 2009, um, which was a bit of a satirical um, <laughs> uh, contribution, I would say, but um, here researchers looked into the neural correlates of interspecies perspective taking by scanning um, actually a dead fish um, and not correcting for multiple comparisons, um, which then led to these um, yeah, activations. And even though it's more or less, was more or less a joke, I would say it still kind of shows that insufficient controls of false positive can lead to very wrong conclusions if you approach an experiment with a certain expectation. And um, yeah, in the, the issue is, um, I would say, still prevalent. And in the studies by Eklund, um, it was shown that mainly random caution, random field theory leads to those high false positive rates when using low cluster defining thresholds. And um, that this is basically um, a consequence of the, of the properties of the fMI data. So long tail spatial autocorrelation and also this spatially varying smoothness. smoothness. And this was shown in a follow-up data where they um, addressed several critiques of their original studies. And um, luckily there's also a way around um, which, which is actually permu using permutation techniques for inference instead of using um, Gaussian random field theory. Um, regarding high analytical flexibility in fMI, you probably all know that pre-processing and analyzing fMI data involves many decisions. So when you think of a classical pre-processing pipeline when going from motion correction over slice timing, co-registration to smoothing, there are a lot, a lot of questions regarding software, regarding algorithm and parameters, 
exclusion criteria that you apply to certain um, head motion or so, for example. And then um, we come to the analysis type. There also you have a variety of possibilities um, using either standard FMI analysis, um, some multivariate pattern analysis, um, then similarity, connectivity, um, yeah, <laughs> you name it. And also here in the choice of the model, the regions of interest parameters, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of flexibility. And this flexibility um, actually matters. And um, as a first example, I would like to show you a study um, where a stop versus go um, uh, experiment was performed in, in 13 participants. And then around 7,000 unique analysis pipelines were applied to the same data. And these were composed out of these, these components. So by just ran, combining all of this possible and also reasonable sets of uh, pre-processing and also um, modeling. And actually what was found in the study is that there was a, were pronounced differences in the mean activation and also in the variability of activation. And this is um, seen here where <clears throat> we have the mean activation, it's yeah, consistently high in some regions but um, the analytical range, so, so the range of Z values um, for the, how, how the Z values differ between those pipelines is also largest in, in those regions. And then when we look at, into the um, proportion of significant voxels, we see that even though yeah, there are some regions that are really reliably um, activated, there are some that are more or less it's more or less on a chance level whether you find them in um, whether you find them with a certain pipeline or or not. And I think this was even more nicely um, demonstrated in a, in a recent paper, where seventy research teams um, were asked to analyze the same data set and to test nine hypotheses. So they were asked to go from the raw data to a decision about certain hypotheses. And um, here it was yeah, also interesting that no two teams, uh, no two teams chose an identical workflow. So there were differences between all of them. And um, there was little agreement on, on the rejection or acceptance of, of these hypotheses. While yeah, there was a stronger agreement for the unthresholded statistical maps. And and this is, this is shown in this figure from this publication, where we see that um, this red square, um, this red square here, um, <clears throat> the unthresholded maps were pretty similar. Um, this is indicated by the red color, so dark red means similarity of 0.8. But the decisions that the teams took um, on the hypothesis are indicated here with green and red. They still varied a lot. So we cannot really see, see a pattern here. So um, this is then, this reflects the fact that, that the um, inference criteria or the, the way that multiple comparison was taken care of had, had a large impact on actually this binary decision. Um, but also differences in smoothing soft and software also were identified as, as main contributors to this. Um, to this diversion results. Um, now let's come to the topic of statistical power. And yeah, yeah, I just have a um, short um, recap question. So I asked you to indicate the correct definition of statistical power. Um, so it's the probability to accept the, uh, the alternative hypothesis. It's the probability to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative is true. Um, or the probability to accept the null when the alternative is actually true. And yeah, let's, let's wait for a bit, but the um, <laughs> looks good, <laughs> the tendency.
Yes. So actually, <laughs> sorry for, <laughs> I just have to go on a bit with my talk. That's why um, it's the probability to reject the null when the alternative is actually true. So to, to really detect the true positive. And when we picture this, um, the, the statistical power can be envisioned as, as this area. So um, the area when, when we stay at an alpha level, so probability to, to falsely reject, uh, to, falsely, uh, to falsely reject the null, um, uh, that the area that stays for us to detect the, the alternative hypothesis. And this um, depends on several factors, namely the sample size, um, the effect size, so the, um, the difference between the two means in this case, so this is the simplest example, and the standard deviation, so the spread, these distributions, and um, also the, the alpha levels of the um, um, type, uh, the type one error. <clears throat> and um, we can so visualize this here when, when just looking at a standardized effect size. So um, 0.2, we can um, think, we, we see that actually the, the power, so the probability that we will um, correctly reject the null and accept the alternative when it is true, um, yeah, increases increases with uh, the sample size. And this is also the whole point of power analysis, but come back to that. <laughs> um, and now when considering neural imaging, um, there was this study I briefly mentioned showing that there's some pretty low power in fMRI studies. Actually with the median power, um, of 20% it was at the time. So, I mean, this is 10 years ago, um, but still. And this low power also leads to a low probability of detecting a true effect when um, the effect sizes that, that we expect in the field are actually small. Um, so there's another figure from this publication. And this pre-study odds is this, this um, a measure of the effect size you would you would find typical in your in your field, and um, for fMRI, I would say that we also range that we range in this uh, between yeah small and medium effect sizes, so maybe between 0.2 and 0.4. And um, here, there would be the next question for you to to estimate from from this from this figure. How, if we have a pre-study odds of 0 0.2, um, how likely would you be to detect the effect if you have only 20% power, so this median power of fMRI studies? And yeah, you have to maybe look look a bit to yeah try to um, yeah try to e extrapolate or interpolate a bit from these graphs. And Yeah, so yeah, so I would agree with with most of you that that we would fall around probably with twenty percent power somewhere here, so around around thirty percent. So only in in one in one over three cases you would actually find. Um, find the effect uh, with this with this low power. So this is um, not so nice. <laughs> and there was an update um, with which was a text-based analysis of power um, in major cognitive neuroscience journals. Um, and this dated from 2017, which is also not quite up to date, but a bit better. And um, here in this study, they found that actually neuroscience um, studies were um, actually much <laughs> worse than psychology and medical studies. And they showed that when having a rather large effect size of 0.5, um, one would, there were only 10% of um, studies that had a power of 80% to detect this effect. And of course, for the small effect, this was even worse. And so this 
illustrates a bit that this is that this is still an issue in in your imaging. Yeah, so yeah, I just um, told you about these three, let's say, three issues uh, regarding replicability um, and reproducibility of, of fMRI studies. And now I would like to highlight um, how pre-registration could help with that. And when we consider the research cycle again, um, pre-registration, so formulating your hypothesis and analysis steps beforehand, um, naturally helps you with, with the issue of p-hacking because if you follow your protocol um, in a straight way and um, don't dive into different analysis techniques, for example, you are um, very likely to not, to not do any p-hacking. And then when you have built confidence into your, um, into your hypothesis and your analysis during the pre-registration, you will also be likely to publish it. So not put it in the file drawer, but say, okay, I really, thought about this, I have really made a plan and I will publish this because I trust this null result. And um, I also think that pre-registration can also help in some way um, with the issue of low statistical power. Um, and this is because when preparing a pre-registration, you are very explicitly asked to uh, justify your sample size and this automatically leads you into, into thinking about um, statistical power. And yeah, behind pre-registration, I would say, is, is a bit the idea that has been summarized by Richard Feynman here. So the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, but you are the easiest person to fool. So with a pre-registration, you, you are less likely to, to fool yourself, for example, by interpreting your results in, in another way after having seen them. And there are many other things that are all not, not conscious. And so it's not that we're bad people, but just that we're really passionate about our topics. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so now what is pre-registration? And here I just wanted to ask to, to get an overview, how many of you have actually um, have ever pre-registered a study or maybe even just a single analysis? Um, Okay, but that's cool. So some people have really done it already. That's nice. And I would say that this is um, probably better than, I mean, we are also in open science context here, but it's probably a lot better than, the, than in the usual, <laughs> if you would ask this in a very general population of researchers. Um, so that's cool. So just a brief definition. In it's the specification of research design, hypothesis, and analysis plan prior to observing the outcomes of the study. And yeah, when, when should you do that? Um, yeah, it already said in the definition that it should be prior to observing the outcomes. So the best, or the be ideally, you would create a timestamp document and that shows that you pre-registered and fixed everything before you start collecting your data. But of course, um, it's okay anytime before you really start the analysis, as long as you're transparent about what you know about the data. Um, and it's also possible to pre-register secondary and data analysis. For example, if you work with large scale databases like I do, like the Human Connectome Project or UK Biobank or so, um, a lot is known about your data, but you can still pre-register the specific analysis that you are doing. And what's also possible is that you amend your pre-registration so that you say, oh, I made a mistake in this and that part, and I would like to, to fix it, but still all with the goal of being transparent about what you, what you did to your data. Um, what, what can you pre-register? So here to say that you can basically specify everything <laughs> that you know beforehand. So of course, um, your hypothesis, the design with fixed decisions. So which should be your outcome measures, which should be uh, exclusion criteria, covariates, decision rules. If we cannot do something, we will do something else. Um, the manipulations you would do to the data. Um, the pre-processing steps you will take, the pipelines, 
with all parameters, the data quality assurance steps, um, the statistical models, of course, also with rules for outliers, data transformation, contrasts, so on. Um, rules of interpretation, also saying that when we find an effect size of this, this will be judged as a support for certain hypotheses. And also you can um, write about potential exploratory analysis. Um, how to do it? Um, yeah, I would recommend the Open Science Framework, which is a homepage where you can also upload your registration and create projects. And there are several templates that really make, make things easier. So there's a general template for behavioral studies. Um, there's an EEG template. There's a template for secondary data analysis. And then there's the FMI template that um, I'd like to just advertise here a bit because um, our Open Science Initiative um, worked on it in, in a peer community effort. So we organized several hackathons to improve um, an existing one. And we try to balance it between det detailedness and conciseness. So giving really all of the hints that you have to have for FMI, which involves so many steps and so many um, decisions, but also not, not overwhelming the reader with, with every, all the explanations and everything. And you can check it out on the psych archives, or there's also a version of our Markdown version on GitHub. And yeah, I guess you will receive the slides later, so you can have a look there. Um, and then there's also S Predictive, which is another platform. And here you get a really short template, which is only nine questions long, and yeah, which is also fine. But here it depends more on you if you cover everything or if you forget things. Okay, um, now coming back to the power topic. So in your um, pre-registration template, you will be asked um, for sample size rationale. And in the OSF, it looks like this. Um, and so they say that it's optional, but actually I think it should not be optional, but you should really should explain why you measure a certain number of people. And this can either be in power analysis or also an arbitrary constraint, such as time, money, or personal. Um, and here for FMI studies, I would say that, yeah, of course, power analysis is the really advised way to justify your sample size. But often, as I experience, this, uh, as I experience it, it's also the case that financial time resources play also a role that simply you, do, you don't have enough scan time, for example, to, to scan more subjects. Um, still, I think power analysis is useful. Um, and, uh, but yeah, not so easy for FMI studies. And this is um, due on the one hand to the complexity of the design and the modeling. Um, so I guess Cameron will talk about this more about the, that there's within subject variance, um, between subject variance, temporal correlation of, of time, um, of the of the time series, um, and effect sizes may vary across the brain. And another point is of course that there's also um, the spatial inference. Is, so you're not looking at a single at a single outcome, but you are actually having to correct for all these tests, and thereby come different definitions of power. So have, have a peak-wise power or box device. So, um, but despite this, I would like to recommend some things for FMI pre-registration, which on the one hand is to definitely do a power analysis um, uh, if you also acquire behavioral data, um, because this can already give you give you a hint how many people you should at least in, um, at least um, include. Or you can also do this with extracted FMI parameters. So let's say um, hippocampus activation or so, and then you can just plug this in into usual power tools like G-Star Power or Power Package and R. Um, um, if the N is limited by other factors or when you have a secondary data set, um, I would recommend to check the smallest effect size um, that you would be able to look at with this power. Um, or also to look 
um, to, to go from the, the effect size that you're expecting and, and see which power would you actually need for that. Um, of course, um, you can also conduct FMI power analysis with one of the tools that I will present or simulate your experience. But yeah, Cameron, Cameron will talk about this, I guess. Um, and yeah, a good good thing to keep in mind is to to rather keep it simple because it's it can get very it can get very complicated and I think some um, some good good conclusions can already be drawn from from these steps and looking at um, behavioral data that was similar and um, checking the smallest effect size and maybe doing an analysis in a region of interest um, yeah so would be my recommendation for this. Um, yeah, if n is fixed, um, what I said is that if you have the sample size, then you can calculate the minimum effect size you could detect with, for example, 80% power. Um, if you have powered your analysis um, for a certain effect size, let's say for a behavioral effect, then you can also calculate the minimum effect size you would be able to detect. And this has been suggested by um, Daniel Larkins in a, in a blog post. And there's also a shiny app where you can try this. And for example, in this uh, here in this example, he, we have an analysis that is powered with 80% for uh, cones D of 0 0.6. Um, and in, yeah, with this, uh, with this settings, um, only effects that would be larger than 0.4 um, would be statistically significant. So, if you have performed this power analysis for your behavioral data and then think, ah, yeah, maybe my fMRI effects will not be that large, then probably you should you should adjust. So this is also um, you can use this to compare the, the smallest effect size that you're interested in. Yeah. And in any cases, so I don't I don't stress it too much, but in any case, if you think, ah, my sample size is <laughs> Is if I'm honest, it's a bit too too small. Then try to boost it by using open data sets, um, collaborations, and all of that. So I think this is really really very valuable. And um, yeah. Um, oh, I didn't fix my <laughs> animation. Sorry. So one way to to calculate this peak based um, so to really calculate um, your power for yeah, my experiment is peak-based um, power calculation. So this, um, this toolbox basically uses the distribution and the height of, um, of uh, cluster peaks. So you're going with a um, cluster threshold and then you're having a certain number, number of peaks and certain height. And um, thereby it just yeah, focuses on these uh, single points and thereby already reduces the multiple testing and simplifies the model. And this um, approach requires a statistical map um, that can either come from a pilot study or also from neural vault, for example, if you're looking into a well-described effect, I would say, like an activation um, in faces versus houses or so, you could also take that one. And then um, this uh, toolbox assumes a mixing of the um, null distribution and the alternative distribution in terms of peak heights. So for the null distribution, we assume it's kind of um, that peaks would be distributed in this way. And then for the alternative distribution, peaks are expected to be distributed around a certain um, peak height. And Using maximum likelihood, this toolbox then estimates the three parameters, so the, the mean and um, sp a spread of the alternative distribution and, and the mixing between the two. And this then allows you to calculate your power to um, detect these, to detect the alternative peaks. And this is all very nicely described in on neural power tools. Um, and there's a tutorial and you can even I think upload your data there and do it there directly on the homepage. And it's based on a, on a preprint by Donas and others in, in 2016. 
Um, yeah, so this is a very on a very top level, uh, I would say. And when you want to go a bit more into the into the, really the, the data properties, then there, there is or there was at least a way to perform two level a power simulation using fmi power by janet mumford and this was um, flexible for first different set first and second level designs um, it used a region of interest averaged values and also required pilot data unfortunately in preparation of this talk i saw that actually the fmi power tool um, seems to be deprecated and um, what um, Janet Mumford um, advises now is to um, perform a region of interest analysis. Um, so yeah, and then thereby average average across voxels and get an effect size that you can carry out a regular power analysis on. Um, and yeah, so that's a bit sad. So I hope she will publish some more of that on that soon. But just for you to um, maybe get an idea how this worked. Um, basically, the um, the whole simulation uh, had, on the one hand, known known determinants of power and everything that we could describe. For example, the first level and second level contrasts. And then there were things that were unknown, like the within subject variance and the temporal autocorrelation or between subject variability. And all of these um, were fitted from the first and second level model residuals. And with um, this setup of for power analysis, it was possible to incorporate both the effects of first level design. Here, for example, we see that with increasing number of um, of blocks on off blocks, um, power also uh, power also increased. And um, same with number of participants. So both first and second level parameters could be modeled. Yeah, but unfortunately, this seems to be not really recommended anymore um, to do it like this. Um, another topic I wanted to, to quickly highlight was, is which is also related somehow to, to power analysis is the very general differentiation between confirmatory and exploratory analysis. And here we have another and the last question. Um, which is basically what, which, which of these hypotheses would refer to, to exploratory? Um, and yeah, it's a bit of a tricky question. So, um, would it be um, differences across groups in brain activation? So you would really have to, to think that people formulate their hypothesis in this way, so in this very generic way. Um, and then I think it becomes clear that um, actually, actually all of these, in the way that they are written, they all are pretty exploratory, so they are not really falsifiable. And um, for example, if you expect group differences in a, in amygdala, let's say, this is not, yeah, I will show this in a bit. And also, if you believe that different cognitive processes are involved, um, but any sign of these would confirm your hypothesis, you are also more or less exploring. Um, also, when you do it in a new study, in a new study population where you don't know what to expect, or if you perform truly data-driven analysis. And I think especially the topic of spatial specificity is, is important and also relates to relates to power, because um, often we formulate hypotheses for gross anatomical regions like amygdala also. And um, this then leads to unspecific results regarding the exact location and um, the psychological processes involved. Um, and here, there were, um, I wanted to show you a replica um, study that looked at 100 replications, um, replication studies that claimed that they replicated an activation in amygdala. And out of those, um, 42 did not report any coordinates, <laughs> which is bad. And um, out of the 50% that reported coordinates, actually, the, they used two approaches to, to define an 
to define an ROI or to use just a qualitative, um, uh, to just qualitatively say this is amygdala also. And actually the, the peak, diff, the peak dist distance of the original study with the replication studies, they were very similar for both, both these approaches and over 50% of the studies um, reported a peak difference that was larger than amygdala diameter. So it's not really, not really possible to, yeah, um, they, they ended up in a different region that still they were able, they were able to call amygdala, um, which basically um, opens the opportunity to replicate everything. <laughs> you just have pretty creative um, descriptions of the regions. Um, and yeah, this is also a very interesting study about, yeah, um, about testing spatial hypothesis, I think. Um, yes, so um, to th what, what we should take away from this is be precise when doing this. And this also relates to doing your power analysis exactly for this region or for this peak um, by using prior study peak information. Um, by using a specific neurosynth definition or specific parcellation and anatomical definitions. And generally patterns of activity can more reliably be compared across studies like similarity metrics and so. And now I want to go to come to my summary, um, which, well, yeah, what you could take away from this talk is that Pre-registration enables you to do more reproducible fMRI studies um, uh, out of different, <laughs> various different reasons. Um, Pre-registration templates um, help you to formulate all the necessary details and to be really specific. And power analysis, I would say, is strongly recommended. And I, sh I showed you, gave you some ideas how to do it. But yeah, it's not trivial. And here yeah, I would so recommend if, if you do it um, also in a simple way, that's, that's perfectly, that's already a good step into the right direction. Um, and with this, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in this. So mainly my, my open science initiative. So it's um, soon again, we will be in Christmas time again. And, um, yeah, you may also join our mailing list if you like. It's open to people from the outside and also follow us. And I think it's also nice to, to connect with the Italian initiatives. And then I would also like to um, thank everybody who worked on the pre-registration template, which were a lot of people from also my community. And yeah, I think we have some time for immediate questions now and otherwise the general discussion later. Thanks, Frauke. Uh, I think we are already uh, a question by Leonardo Vipini. If, uh, if, yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Thanks a lot. First of all, uh, I have a quick question. Uh, that is more uh, a curiosity as well. A few days ago, I came across a, a paper from 2018 that I found it very interesting related to, to this topic of power in neuroimaging. And it was um, about behavioral pre-screening. And I was wondering if you know what it's about. Honestly, I didn't have time to read it, but look, a very nice way to, to come across sort of step forward uh, uh, you know, uh, beside and um, apart from what you, of course, said, which is all true. Yeah. Uh, so just curiosity, if you if you know, because yeah, it it's quickly says that it's a sampling strategy to detect brain behavior correlation uh, in case of limited resources and so. So, yeah, just curiosity. I can put the the paper in the chat if you. Yeah, that would be uh, nice. Yeah, I haven't heard of it. I can just imagine that you try to. Um... Yeah, possibly select participants based on their based on their behavioral performance, right? And then also kind of assume that their also fMRI response would be would be the difference would be maximized between groups or so. 
um, but I haven't really applied it, but it seems it seems um, yeah reasonable to not scan, for example, people that then don't don't show the expected response or that have somehow um, yeah low lower activation or so. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah okay. Yeah. I Nice I put it in the in the chat yeah. and okay. I'm curious myself to read it. It was just a curiosity. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks. Gabriela, um, you I think you could uh, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, great talk. I have just a question, curiosity too. Um, when we are facing with, uh, for example, rare pathology and we have just like one uh, subject and we have a very low statistical power, you think that this kind of work are still uh, have a value, this kind of work or are uh, misleading or uh, full of error? I mean, when we have, for example, one sample versus a population, a single case study in general. I think single case studies also also have their value also have their value definitely and uh, I think just that framing this in this context of um, yeah frequentist uh, statistical testing is just then not not really the right approach or so so probably it's good to then just maybe not even performing inference statistical inference but just comparing let's say activation levels and just describing them in a way and and having a bit or maybe even using and would not i'm not sure if that would work but having more like bayesian statistics or so to to kind of see if maybe they're coming from different ground truth so yeah but i think all of what i said is more yeah, more related to these larger studies where people try to make really these group inferences. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, of course, it's still, it's still valuable, but probably needs different description of the data and the results than, yeah, for this case. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with uh, the second talk of the symposium, uh, Dr. Cameron Ellis completed his PhD in psychology in, 2000, in 2021 from Yale University uh, by way of Princeton University, working with Dr. Nicholas Clark Brown. He received his uh, bachelor from University of Auckland, New Zealand in uh, 2013. In his primary research, he studies how basic building blocks of cognition emerge and mature in infant brain. It seeks to understand how infants adapt to challenges they face during development. He developed methods for conducting fMRI with awake, behaving infants and pursued three directions. One, how the visual system is organized early in life, long before visual abilities reach maturity. Two, how attention enables infants to sift through a world full of complexity. And three, how infants can learn so much yet remember so little of their early life experiences. In a several research program, he develops and leveraged new neuroimaging analysis methods to gain deeper insight into the nature of the human mind. Cameron, floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for this invitation. Especially uh, thank you to Dr. Bayer for that amazing um, talk and what really is a useful primer for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so it, it there'll be a lot of parts where I'm not going to go through as, in as much detail as I planned because Dr. Bayer did an amazing job at explaining that. Uh, but I do encourage you to interrupt me at any point in time if you have questions, but there will also be plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, reflecting on what Franca just talked about and uh, my experience in this, I was confronted with the state of science in 2015 or so when I started neuroimaging. And I was just kind of really worried about this replicability and, and, and this, these concerns that people have. It's easy to get kind of disillusioned or sad about the state of science we're doing when we hear these kinds of statistics that we just heard about. And I kind of wanted to do something about it. And I thought that simulation and uh, particularly as it relates to fMRI could be a really powerful way in. And I think of simulation as giving us a lot of tools that uh, can be really useful as scientists. So for instance, 
simulations can allow us to estimate the effect size needed to find a significant result in a study. And so this can uh, let us do power analyses that we were just hearing about that aren't necessarily using the kind of parametric or kind of potentially simplified ways of doing power analysis that are otherwise available to us, but they kind of let us fully represent the complexity of the analysis that we're going to run and effectively analyze the power in that domain. They also, when we're getting power, we're also able to evaluate the effect of design choices. We can tweak our design and how that will affect the simulation and see whether that will improve or hurt our power. And so we can optimize our design to find the effect that we want to study. And, uh, and another clearly critical part about this is that it really facilitates the process of pre-registration. If you created a simulation before you run your study, then you can pre-register that simulation in the corresponding analysis code. And then to the world, they will see your hypotheses, they will see your analysis, and you can very easily then just plug in your real data. It's as if you're running a pilot study where you're then trying to replicate it, except the pilot study is fake data and the real study, the replication uses real data, but the same framework applies. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, simulation with fMRI. In particular, I'm gonna be talking about the package called fMRI Sim that I developed a few years ago. And then going to talk actually quite briefly now, especially because what we've just heard from Praka about the ability for simulation to facilitate pre-registration and power analysis. And then I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about example applications of how this can be used to facilitate uh, open science and just generally reproducible science. But first on to fMRI sim. Simulation of fMRI data has existed for decades now, actually. There have been many packages that have existed to support simulating of fMRI data. The initial packages and many different packages don't necessarily try and simulate fMRI data in its full complexity. Here is a simulation of fMRI data, but it's not simulating kind of what a brain looks like. What it's really simulating is the spatial smooth, uh, the smooth property, sorry, the spatial properties of fMRI data, it captures the smoothness of it. And this package, SimTB, has been really useful for analyzing or simulating rather uh, connectivity analyses. But probably the most um, popular package in simulation was NeuroSim, a package written in R that allows you to simulate fMRI data using a variety of different properties, uh, metrics for quantifying noise, and allows you to approximate noise in a relatively realistic way, at least if you give it the right set of parameters. However, when I got into the space, there were none that existed in the Python language, which we thought was a really important thing because Python is a kind of growing language that's very accessible and open. And also another important thing is that the packages didn't have one specific feature that we thought was really important, which was to extract noise properties from real data and then leverage those noise properties in generating new data. Uh, and so that's one feature that we thought would be really uh, essential for a simulation package. So starting in around 2014, 2015, uh, I just joined Princeton University as a graduate student and uh, Princeton collaborated with Intel, the computer company, and they had a multi-year project that they were collaborating on. And one of the main outputs of this project was Brainiac.org or Brainiac, uh, the, the software package. And so this is the website that you can go to to find out about Brainiac. But Brainiac is a Python package that collects a lot of different neuroimaging analysis methods, specifically kind of advanced neuroimaging analysis methods, not pre-processing methods, but more complicated ones. It speeds them up. So it uses high performance computing compatibility or it uses sophisticated code to make that those analyses run faster. And it puts them in a single environment where it's easy to kind of interoperate between those, those, those um, tools. So there are many different tools available uh, in Brainiac environment. There are the basic ones like MVPA or RSA, but then there's tweaks to both of those kinds of packages. So for instance, with MVPA, there's functionality to be able to run a parallel search light. So if you've got a cluster, you can now distribute that computation across a hundred nodes. So whereas a job might take a year to compute, you can run it in a day because you've parallelized the, the computation. 
Similarly, RSA, there's a Bayesian version of RSA that accounts for specific noise properties that are, uh, are a problem when conducting RSA analysis. And then there are analyses that are completely unique to kind of Brainiac. So for instance, shared response modeling is a functional alignment method that can't really easily be found in other packages. And so Brainiac brings together these different um, functions and uh, makes them accessible and open to everyone. The simulation package, fMRI sim, is part of Brainiac and it's kind of within this environment. And so Brainiac has several nice features about it, which make it a really good package and kind of unique, at least in the science domain. One is that the documentation for it is superb. There's really clear um, guidelines in terms of how you're uploading functions and how you must comment it very clearly and give everything a clear header and good description. And that makes it extremely accessible to people trying to get into it. Another uh, really important aspect of it is that we do a lot of testing. So anytime anyone makes any changes to the code, every single line of code effectively is run through a test to make sure that that code does what it was doing before someone made that change. And so it's really um, quite a stable piece of code base and you'll be very aware if something you're doing changes or breaks the code because it will, will violate those tests. Another really great thing about this package is that there's a lot of tutorials available for it. So for instance, uh, myself and uh, collaborators at Princeton and also collaborators here at Yale, we created a course that we taught to students at Yale, mainly undergraduate uh, students, in fact, and that there was a corresponding course taught at Princeton to undergraduate students where we taught all of these analyses methods, starting at basic classification. I said basic because that's the first thing that we taught it. And then going up to real-time fMRI or to doing kind of intersubject correlation analyses or doing functional alignment, sophisticated analyses that very few people in the world know how to run. We created a course that makes it accessible even to undergrads to run these things. And this course is all available online. In fact, you can just run it from Google Cloud. You don't need to have it high performance computer, you don't even have to have, you can run it on your cell phone if you want to. So these are maximally accessible tools. And as I mentioned, fMRI sim is one part of this tool, uh, one part of this package that we think is, is particularly useful. So the goal of fMRI sim was to simulate data with realistic noise properties. Now, realistic, that word is doing a lot of work in that sentence. It's a very tricky word and it's very important that we understand what we mean by realistic here. We wanted to create data that passed the sniff test, that was good enough to look like fMRI data to kind of work inside pipelines so that it could trick these pipelines into believing that it's working with real data. So it's like if you're doing alignment of the functional data to anatomy, that the functional data would align to anatomy in normal ways, that kind of thing. Or, and, and another way in which we wanted it to be realistic is that we want to make it so that it accounted for the main types of noise in fMRI data, at least that we know about. So that if you were to do analyses like a univariate analysis or a multivariate analysis, that the noise that we're putting in there will make it such that the kind of signal that you're injecting into the brain will lead to reasonable results. As in like, how much signal do I need to add to how much noise? And does that seem about right for what would normally do and expect from it right? And so that was our goal. Critically, we don't think that we've like perfectly created a perfect model of fMRI data and, and the noise properties of fMRI data. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but we think that this is in the ballpark. To give you an idea of what we mean by that, so on the top row, you see an example of real data from a single frame of a functional run of fMRI. And then on the bottom row, you see a simulation of that. And just in general, they're approximately similar to one another. And also here are voxel time courses. And you see on the top row, again, real data on the bottom row, you see simulated data. And in general, the, the time course looks approximately the same or has about the same kind of problem. Another goal of fMRI sim is that we want to make it really tractable so that like anyone can pick up the code and go running. Here is an example script that you would need to generate uh, a participant or 100 participants with um, fMRI sim. Critically, there's only about like eight or nine different functions that you have to run. And those functions receive a set of parameters that aren't that complicated, many of which can be generated kind of uh, in a data-driven fashion. Critical idea being that like you can give it an example participant and it can extract the noise properties from those participants and then create new participants with those same noise properties. And that's all run relatively easily without any supervision. So it's very relatively short amounts of code that you need to use. Also, there are a lot of tutorials available to enable you to uh, 
to run to learn how to run this code. And so there's a great tutorial available on GitHub that, and also linked on my website that I'll share at the end that allows you step by step to see the kind of process of making this simulation. And I think that makes it, and it's very clearly explained kind of what's happening in each step. So that will make anyone who's kind of like more than beginner, so like maybe a moderate skilled user, intermediate skilled user of Python, kind of figure out how to use this, this tool. Okay, so this is kind of a brief primer of what fMRI Sim is about. I just want to give you a sense of kind of how well fMRI Sim is able to simulate fMRI data. So there are two main kinds of tests that we can do in order to check how well it's doing at simulating fMRI data. The first one is just a really simple idea of just eyeballing the data. So like, does the fMRI data look similar to real data? And we kind of did this before, but I just want to lean into it a little bit more here. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing you fMRI sim, and on the right-hand side, I'm showing you NeuroSim. These are two different data sets, so you can't easily compare between the two um, models, between fMRI sim and NeuroSim. But this top row is showing you real data. This is kind of the, the input to fMRI sim or to NeuroSim. And on the bottom row, you see the simulated data. And in general, you can see both models are doing, both methods are doing pretty well at simulating data. Let's just zoom in on one slice of this and one part of it. And you can see here, you maybe start to see differences between the packages. Importantly, they're mostly similar, but there is like a slight difference between them. So for instance, if you write some, if you look at these, this yellow circle, you can see that the gray matter, white matter contrast is pretty apparent, both in the simulation and in the real data. But if you look at the corresponding kind of gray matter, white matter distinction, it's not really super apparent in the simulated data relative to the real data. Nonetheless, uh, the, they had both in general, they look kind of like real data. But one of the things that we did with fMRI sim is we went beyond eyeballing it to see like, does it look good enough? And we created a testing infrastructure that we just thought could be useful for this package as well as any other simulation package that was invented in the future to be able to decide this is a good simulation of fMRI data. And the idea was that we can extract from real data some noise properties, in this case, something like signal to noise ratio, which is basically how intense are voxels inside the brain versus voxels outside of the brain. That's the idea of signal to noise ratio or SNR. You can extract that from real data. And we want to make it so that we can create simulated data that has those same properties, as it has the same signal to noise ratio as the real data. And it should be specific to individuals. So it's like, this individual has low SNR and they should have the same amount of SNR when you, um, in, in their simulation. And so here is an example, this is gonna be 17 participants and we see a massive range in SNR. So there's a huge variability within, across real participants in terms of the SNR from collected scans. And what we can do is we can say, okay, we're gonna run a simulation on this. The, the way the simulation works, how fMRSM works is it extracts the noise properties from the individual it then simulates data based on the noise. And now we're gonna test it. Does it have the noise properties that we, we tried to make it have based on the simulation? And so a perfect result would be a set of horizontal lines like you're gonna see such that the, the noise, the, 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 the parameter is the same in the real data versus the simulated data based on that real data. So what you see here is a bunch of gray lines representing the kind of transition from the real to simulated data. And you see that in general, these are pretty flat lines. There is a slight decrease down. So there's a bias towards lowering the SNR in the simulation. But the critical point is that the simulated data is in within like a percent point of the real data in terms of the amount of change in that simulation. So the, the simulation is really accurately simulating the real data according to this metric. But we didn't just test it in terms of SNR, we actually tested on four different metrics. So here's the SNR results. The SFNR, another metric of signal to noise ratio, but now in time, you see a similar decrease across um, from real to simulated. But again, it's mostly flat. Again, the percent change is pretty small. Here is autoregression, kind of like how rapidly the signal is changing. Here you don't see a bias such that it's always decreasing or always increasing. It's a little bit more mixed. But again, the percentage change between the real and simulated data is on average very low. And then finally, full width half max, which is like the smoothness of the data, that's also relatively when in doubt. So the simulation isn't perfect. If it was perfect, all of these lines would be horizontal. But it is in the ballpark of kind of an appropriate simulation. It's, it's getting the kind of, particularly within individual uh, variants or like capturing the kind of uniqueness of the individual, it's doing that pretty well. 
Uh, and so this simulation is pretty good at recovering kind of the noise properties of real simulated, of, of real data. What do you need to do fMRI sim? So I, uh, how do you run this? I'm not gonna go through a long tutorial of how this works. As I mentioned, I think that's better served by the packages and the tutorial examples that are posted online. If you do have any questions, I'm very open for you to reach out to me. I often like help people. I'm very willing to do this. Like, free of charge, no authorship required, just reach out and ask me questions. Uh, I'm very happy to help at any time. I was doing it yesterday morning, in fact, with someone in Germany. So uh, what do you need to do this though? There are four main things that you need to conduct fMRI sim. First, to do it properly in the way that we recommend is you wanna have an example set of participants that uses input to the simulator to extract the, the noise properties of that you can then model the simulation based on. You also have to have an idea of where you're going to put the signal in the brain. This could be a set of voxels that you've got coordinates for. It could be a cube, a sphere. It could also be an ROI. So it's like you want to study the hippocampus, you want to simulate the hippocampus, just give it an ROI of the hippocampus. You have to have an idea of when the signal will be evoked. So it's like, this is the task design that you're simulating. And you know, that can we've created tools that you can just give it a timing file like you'd normally use for analysis and either cell. And finally, and this is a really important one, is that you have to have an idea of how much signal is going to be evoked. And we've got a lot of tools to allow you to specify that in different ways. So for instance, if you want to quantify the signal in terms of percent signal change, then you can quantify it that way. You can say that we think the signal is going to be a 0.5% signal change or a 1% signal change, but that would be a really strong signal, that kind of thing. You, you, all of those tools are available to you when designing fMRI. There are many different types of studies that you can run uh, with fMRI sim. In fact, I actually think that basically any type of fMRI study can be simulated. I'm yet to find an fMRI study that I don't think would be appropriate for fMRI sim in general in terms of the type of analysis. So this includes like univariate analyses, comparing within individual, between individuals, between ROIs, that kind of thing. It's also critically multivariate methods. And that's in fact, actually the main motivation for designing fMRI sim is that we want it to be appropriate for multivariate methods. And this includes very complicated methods like you might use for encoding models where you're expecting that like a CNN will be evoking, a certain, sorry, a, a movie will be evoking a certain pattern of activity in the brain and you want to decode that with a CNN or represent that for the CNN. We've actually done that with um, fMRI sim. All of this is doable. However, there is a gradient such that the univariate analyses and those kinds of uh, simulations are the easiest ones to do. And then the more difficult simulations are the ones that are using multivariate methods. Importantly, I think this kind of stuff doesn't take that long to do. I personally can, run, can create a univariate simulation within about two hours. And I could create a complicated multivariate one, maybe like four or five hours. Now, I'm an expert, I wrote the code, that kind of thing. But I think that anyone who's novice to that could probably do the same kind of thing in 10, 20 hours, 30 hours, that kind of thing. So it's, it takes some time, it takes some investment, but it's not out of the ballpark of the difficulty of, of doing this kind of thing. When is fMRI sim not appropriate? Because there are some cases, even though it might be general to lots of different types of fMRI studies, it's not general necessarily to all the uses that we have for fMRI. And there may be some boundary conditions for when fMRI sim isn't useful. So one case where fMRI sim might not be useful is when you have no hypothesis. You're conducting an fMRI study and you have no expectations about where in the brain you're going to find differences, what types of differences you're going to find, that kind of thing. FMRI sim won't work there because you need to have a hypothesis. You need to have an idea of what signal it is that you're inserting into the brain. I would suggest a little caution about running that study though. If you don't have a hypothesis about like what it is you expect to find, perhaps that's a sign that maybe you shouldn't actually be running that fMRI study. But nonetheless, if you don't have that strong, if you don't have a hypothesis, then you can't move forward with fMRI sim. A more likely scenario though, would be one where you have no data that you want to use as the basis for your simulation. So remember I said that you need real data that you use to, um, to make your simulation. And critically, you want that real data to match the actual data that you're going to collect. So it's like uh, that it's representative of the actual data you're going to collect as closely as possible. Let's say that you're, you've got a new scanning protocol if you have a new scanning protocol, that's going to affect the simulation. So you want to make sure that your input data uses that same scanning protocol. Well, let's say you're studying elderly individuals. You want to make sure that your simulation uses data from elderly individuals and not data from 20-year-olds, for instance. 
So it's possible that you won't have that data that you already when you want to run the simulation. There are hundreds of published data sets that may have those participants, but maybe they don't have the combination of adult, uh, the age range and the, the protocol that you've collected. So it may be the case that you just don't have that data available. I would suggest though, that there are two alternatives here. One is that you could run a first, a quick pilot where you just collect one or two participants and use those participants as the basis for your simulation. Alternatively, and this is what Franco also talked about, is that you could run your entire study, you've collected all of your participants, and then before you do any analyses, you use those participants as the basis for your simulation, you set up your analysis pipeline, then you, you go forward, you pre-register, what have you, and then you, you analyze your data using what you've learned from the simulation. That's a not ideal approach if you even wanted to make changes to your design, but it's certainly compatible with this. The final case where fMRI sim is inappropriate, and this one's very important for me, is when the simulation is not good enough for the data that you're collecting. And I think this is a really critical consideration, especially in certain research domains. So as was mentioned before, I do research with awake behaving infants. I study infants while they're in the scanner, they're doing tasks. This is a new domain where there's very, very few studies being published. We don't really understand the noise properties of infant data. In fact, that's part of the analysis itself. We don't really know what the hemodynamic response looks like in infants. We don't know if physiological result responses have the same properties as they do in adults. There are many unknowns when we're doing this. In addition to this, motion is a really critical factor when doing infant research. In fact, it's like the most important thing in terms of signal quality. And fMRI sim does not have good tools for simulating motion. It's a complicated topic, but basically simulating motion is really, really hard. There's non-trivial non factors about motion that make it very difficult to simulate. And because of that, it's, I haven't used fMRI sim to, in, to model infant data because I don't think it's a good approximation of infant data. I think it's a really good approximation of adult data, and that's what I've used it for, but not for infant data. So if you feel like you're in this domain where actually fMRI isn't appropriate for the kind of analysis you wanna do, reach out to me. I'll probably be able to quickly tell you whether I agree or not, because I do know that there are cases where it's not appropriate. Okay, so just to summarize kind of this introduction to fMRI SIM, fMRI SIM can make an approximate model of fMRI noise. Now, I put an asterisk there to just remind you, we don't think that we're cell neuroscience. We don't think that we've accounted for all the different noise properties of fMRI data. We are aware of the limitations of this, but we do think that this is a good first start. It's in the ballpark. And we also believe that there's value to this work because it's created a framework to validate the simulations that we've collected to know whether the simulations are good or not. But turning now to the big questions, what can we do with this simulation? Does anyone have any questions about fMRI sim before I move on or are we ready to go? Okay, well, please jump in at any point if you do have any questions. Okay, so turning to uh, the point that was discussed in the previous talk and uh, I'm not actually gonna spend that much time on because it was so clearly explained, uh, pre-registration and power analyses are clear advantages that can be achieved with fMRI sim and just generally simulation. So just very quickly, gold standard, uh, the gold standard for reproducible science is pre-registration. It's chronically used in the medical field because they're aware that like doing a pre-registration or a clinical trial where you have to tell everyone what you are going to test, how you're gonna test it and how you're gonna analyze it, that is really good at making sure that your results are believable, especially when it's such a high stakes case like medical trials. So just a very quick primer is that you should just hypothesize your results, you pre-register your design and your analysis, you collect your pipeline, you analyze your data. Critically with pre-registration, you're not confining yourself to only ever analyze the data in the way that you specified. Things happen that are surprising and we scientists should explore them and should understand them. And it's just really important to the reader that when you do that kind of exploration, that you don't mislead them into thinking that that was always planned along and it wasn't instead a response to the surprising results of the data. And that becomes really clear when you're doing this, which really helps the reader, it really helps you as a scientist make what is what was predicted clearly uh, uh, available to the reader and they should have confidence in it and makes them also understand the appropriateness of thinking about the non-predictive results. Okay, but it's hard to talk about pre-registration in fMRI without considering the fact that fMRI is extremely complicated. And we have a lot of different reasons for why it's complicated and a lot of great examples of how 
different decisions that are being made of which there are hundreds can creep into fMRI and make it really difficult for us to do reproducible science. Now, there are a lot of different pipelines for pre-processing that help us with this. And they kind of like set in stone the steps that we're gonna take for pre-processing. But even so, there are also a, a lot of steps that are done at in the analysis stage that allow us to have a lot of degrees of freedom as the researcher. And that can really hurt our ability to create reproducible science and also even to pre-register our science. So let's say that we pre-register an analysis saying that we want to conduct um, uh, decoding of faces versus scenes, a pre-traditional decoding analysis. And we just specify we're going to decode faces versus scene in our training run. Well, how are you going to do that decoding? You need to specify like many, many different parameters. You need to say how you're selecting your voxels, what time envelope of the data that you're analyzing, what kernel you're gonna use in your classifier, what cost function you're gonna use, et cetera, et cetera. There are many different choices that you can make. And it's very onerous as a researcher to specify all of those and to kind of like think through all of those steps. And I think simulation is a really, can, you can see the value of simulation here. When you think about kind of like how much you as a scientist learn after you've run your first study and kind of got your hands dirty with the data and seeing kind of what things, how things work, what analysis steps you had to take versus what you thought you would have to take before you actually did this. And so simulation, as I framed up front, simulation can be thought of as a pilot study where you're thinking through all of the analysis steps, you're trying to verify that you're getting the results that you planned, and then you actually run the study and you actually see the results that you predicted. And I think that can really help you as a scientist do accurate pre-registration. But more so than that, when you're doing the pre-registration with this kind of simulation, you're actually specifying in code and concrete ways what it is you're going to do. So in all these ways, I think simulation could really help the pre-registration process. So just to explain kind of the pipeline of pre-registering when you're doing a simulation, the first step is, as always, is you, you hypothesize your results. You hypothesize the kind of effect that you think you'll find and the design that you think will achieve it. You then generate simulated data using fMRI sim. So you write the code that will allow you to generate the data. This means like getting the set of participants that you think is, uh, which is representative of the group you're gonna collect. You use them for noise. You generate the signal that you want to simulate and then you insert it into that noise data. Then you create an analysis pipeline to test this data. Because that simulated data is realistic, it can really just substitute in for the real nifty files or DICOM files that you're collecting from the scanner. And you can run through the entire pipeline. The, the data that you're simulating is as if it is raw data. And so you can do everything the same. You create your pipeline. Ideally, it's in packages or otherwise in like succinct formats that you just like are running without any supervision one after the other. And then you get your results. And if your simulation was good, then you got the results that you hypothesized. But as often happens, as happens to myself many a time, you realize that the simulation isn't good enough. And that like there are, there are errors in your design that mean that the results don't come out as strongly as you think they should. And so what you now get the ability to do is to optimize your design. You get to change your design, maybe make the ISI wider between events, or maybe make it so there's more trials or more participants. You could also realize that you don't need as many participants as you hypothesized. And so you could decrease your sample size, all of which is available within this loop that is now gonna be really easy to run because everything's automated. You just click some buttons to simulate the data, you click some buttons to analyze the data and it should all run kind of in an automated fashion. Now you've, you've got your set of simulated data, you've got your analysis that produces the result that you hypothesized. You pre-register everything. You pre-register on something like OSF, your analysis code, your simulation code, the world and, and your methods as well. It's always helpful to have like a written version of this, but the code I think is the most like defined version of your methods you possibly have. And it's available in, in this kind of embargo form that can then eventually be released once you have a paper to report. You collect the data and then you analyze the data according to what you planned. It's now hopefully really easy because you've already written all of the code. And just like before, you can do explicit exploration. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. It's, it, it's always encouraged in this kind of stuff. So when you do this, I think there are several really important benefits that are very unique to this kind of approach of, of simulation and pre-registration. Firstly, you learn what is possible. It has happened to me that I have thought that it would be possible to find a certain effect in fMRI data, and then I simulated it, and I realized it was impossible. 
And this prevented me from running an fMRI study that would have cost, you know, $50,000 because I realized that actually the effect I was looking for was just not going to be possible to manifest in fMRI data due to the smoothing properties and time of, that, of, of how fMRI data works. It will enhance trust in your result, both as you as a researcher, because if you predicted it, you created a pipeline, you simulated it, you found the results in the simulation, and then you found the same result in real data, you should feel very confident yourself. And anyone reading your paper should feel very confident in your results too. It will give you specificity in your predictions. And this is a really important point in the pre-registration world that Fraga talked about, is that it's really helpful to be specific in these ways. And then finally, and this is kind of like an interesting point, is that it makes you think really closely about your analysis and your code in a way that I don't think is very easy to do until you've actually got your hands dirty. You really think about how the brain might be representing this task and what you think is going on in individuals. And this, I really think, helps you as a researcher. There are costs, of course. This does take time. And as I mentioned, it can take tens of hours if you've never done this before. But I think it can also be time-saving because it can prevent you running a study that you shouldn't run. A related cousin of pre-registration is power analysis and fMRI sim really helps with that too. So for instance, you can use this to figure out what the likelihood is of getting the result that you anticipate. So you can say, I'm gonna simulate 24 participants. They're gonna have this signal in the brain that I'm specifying. And then we can ask how many times out of a thousand because I'm gonna run the simulation a thousand times, how many times out of a thousand do I get the result that is significant? And if it's 80% of the time, that's 80% power according to this kind of logic of simulation. And you can run this before the experiment, you can run this after the experiment. It's usable and flexible in the same ways of, of power analysis. It's a critically non-parametric power analysis and it's kind of representing the full complexity of the data set. You don't have to worry about assumptions about how the analysis of the power is working because this is closer to the bone of like how the data will actually be analyzed and how power actually like works. Okay, finally, I'm going to talk about a few applications of fMRI sim where I think it could be particularly useful. So I'm gonna show you an example experiment, uh, which is what participants saw while they're in the scanner. So participants see these fractals, these colorful images, and they're just seeing them one after the other over a long sequence. It's, they're in the scanner for a long time. They're detecting just jittering of these stimulus as a cover task, but actually behind that cover task, what they're seeing is a sequence of images like these 15 fractals that are shown here that are constrained in the ways that are specified by these gray lines. So each fractal can transition to any other fractal that it's connected to by a gray line and will do so with equal probability. So that top green uh, fractal at the top can transition to the one on the top right, but it can't transition to ones like on the bottom left, for instance. That's an impossible transition. It, it can only go where the gray lines are. And so participants see this sequence of events. And although there's a uniform transition probability at this kind of local level between individual fractals, what they might learn over repeated exposure is that these fractals are grouped in specific ways such that they're actually like three different clusters represented by those, um, the, the kind of the pentagon shapes on the top and the bottom left and right. Those three clusters are distinguishable in critical ways. And, the participants may learn that structure over the course of exposure. Indeed, in the study, they found that they did, that in regions of the anterior temporal lobe and inferior frontal gyrus, is that the clusters that were present in the stimulus came to be manifest in the brain data. So that like the orange, uh, the, the stimuli that are depicted in orange, they are more similar to each other in terms of representational space or in terms of how the brain evokes, uh, is activated according to those fractals, how the, those are more similar to one another than they are to the different um, fractals that are presented. And you can study that, uh, and, and they found evidence of that nearly in those regions, but they didn't find it in other regions of the brain. So this effect was something that we wanted to study with our simulation, and we wanted to study it in two specific ways. Uh, sorry. We wanted to use this as a kind of like testing bead of, of fMRI sim to show how we think it could be useful. And critically, we're kind of using it after the fact of how data was collected. But you can imagine this could, have, all of the analyses I'm gonna do could have been done beforehand. Also, they could have been, they could be done now, but like prospectively for a new study. So it's like, let's improve the next study that we wanna run. So the two goals that we had 
was first to investigate how much signal is needed to get this effect. So like, how, what do we have to put into the brain given a certain amount of noise in order to recover the signal that they found? And also what is the nature of that signal that we had to put in? Kind of what do we do to create that representation in the head that uh, will be recoverable? The other question is how does timing affect this design and could we change the timing to be more optimal? So what the simulation looks like is we take the real data that was collected from these participants and we generate noise data based on those participants. We then create stimulus time courses and they are the same as the, the events that the participants actually saw. So we take the exact timing files that the participants saw and we also take the region of the brain that was shown to be significantly activated in those participants. And then we insert signal as we specify it into those brain regions. So we say in these brain regions, when the participants saw this stimulus or when the simulation saw this stimulus, this pattern of activity was evoked in their brain. The way that we think about this signal, and this is, again, I'm talking about like, this is a really helpful exercise for you to think through what you think signal is in fMRI data, something we don't normally have to do. One way to conceptualize it and the most simplest um, way to think about it is imagine that only two voxels in the brain represented the signal. How would two voxels in the brain represent the, the, the structure, that, that community structure, as it's called, uh, that was presented to the participants in terms of those transition pathways? Well, the way it would probably work, that these two voxels would represent it, is simply like this, where it's basically like a scattered plot where each voxel activates a certain amount whenever it sees, whenever the simulation sees that stimulus. As, as is depicted. So if the participant see, if the simulation sees an orange stimulus, then in the voxel A, it's going to activate a lot. And in voxel B, it's going to activate small amounts or moderate amounts. And if it sees purple, it's going to activate differently, that kind of thing. And so this would be the simple way of doing it if we have two voxels. The simulation isn't going to use two voxels, it's going to use 400 voxels. But here's a, a simple way of imagining how the simulation will work, how signal would be represented in the brain. And we can change the signal in many ways. So for instance, one easy way to change the signal is just to turn the volume up, just make everything bigger, make everything more spread apart. And so that's increasing the magnitude. A different way we can change the signal and a really interesting way we can change the signal is to vary the density of those points. So although participants were presented with a sequence such that maybe this is the representation they ought to have if all uniform transitions are represented kind of equally and everything's equally elastic, but maybe instead actually participants have a neural representation once I've learned the sequence that looks more like this, where it's like the different groups are clustered really tightly together and that's actually what they're representing neural. And we can simulate different signals with varying these two properties, both the magnitude of it as well as the density of, of the signal. And so that's what we're gonna do here. We, I'm gonna show you results from the simulation where we're varying the signal change or the, the amount of evoked activity in these voxels, remember it's not two voxels, it's 400 voxels, but we're gonna vary the amount of signal change in the voxels. And we're also gonna vary the density of, of the representation in the simulation. So how, how densely those points are clustered. And the result that we're gonna look at is how different the real data is from the simulated data. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the simulation as close to the real data as possible. So we want this value to be close to zero. First, we can look at what happens when in the bottom row here when we inject no signal into the brain. So 0% signal change, there's no signal. We see that the real and simulated data are pretty different from one another. That's because it's green rather than dark blue. And also when we insert a lot of signal into the brain, so 0.6% signal change and high density, we also see the model, uh, the, the simulated and real data is pretty different from each other. But if we just look at the zero density point, so, so low density here, we can see as we vary signal change that we do indeed see that there is a point around 0 0.5 where the values get to about zero or around about zero. And in fact, if we look across all values of density, we see this trough or this ridge of values near zero where there is no difference between the simulation. This idea that this finding here is effectively a power analysis because what it's saying is that at this amount of signal change, we expect to find a result comparable to what was found if we assume this kind of density. And so according to different types of density, if the participant has a different type of representation, then this is the result we're gonna see. And you can think about doing this kind of analysis where you're saying, assuming a percent signal change, assuming density, 
I'm going to run 12 participants and what percentage of times in my simulation will I get a significant result? And it may be like 20% of the time. Now, what if I run 36 participants? That might be 95% of the time, what have you. All of these options are available to you now when you like think about it in this space. And this really gives you a clear way of, of testing the power of your design. But there's other cool things that we can do with this. Now that we know kind of how much signal we need to inject in order to get the results that we found, we can now change the design in order to see how the changes in the design affect the results that the, that the experimenters could have found. So what we can do is we can just simply manipulate the time course of the experiment that the participants received. So rather than seeing the events occur quickly like they did before, now we can spread them out in time. So make it so that there's more spacing between events. We know from decades of work that spacing between events should really help the ability to extract signal, but it's complicated in the space where we're doing multivariate analyses using RSA. It's unclear how those intuitions affect the kind of the, the assumptions there. And it's really important to make quantitative predictions about that, but there really aren't other tools that can clearly tell us quantitative predictions. So just to give you an idea of the timing of the original experiment, the events occurred one after the other with either one second pause, three second pause, or five second pause. So very quick event related design on average three seconds between each stimulus that was presented, very, very fast. So if we increase that amount of time, how that will affect the result. So zero here is like the original experiment and then adding time onto that, we'll, we'll see the result. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show three different lines for each of the different density representations. So we can say, okay, if the participants have this representation internally, this is the pattern of results that we'd expect to find. What we see is interesting differences based on that density, such that the blue or the low density representation, those that uh, doesn't get nearly as high as the high density representation. So the benefit of increasing the ISI is felt more in terms of if the participants have this really tightly coupled uh, high density neural representation or cognitive representation. And these effects are really large. Like the y-axis is a, a T statistic, which basically means it's like a standard deviation. So if you have an improvement of four standard deviations by increasing your ISI by like four seconds as being shown in that green line, that's a really strong improvement in your effect size. Also, interestingly, there's very clear plateauing that occurs such that when you add even more time, there's really no benefit to increasing it. So this gives you quantitatively precise predictions of what will happen when I change these parameters of my experiment. And you can imagine doing this before you ever ran the study. Here it's suggesting that it would be optimal for you to have a design where you have five to nine seconds ISI between stimuli. But there's another consideration and a thing we can pursue with this, which is when you're doing an fMRI study, you're time limited. You don't want the participant to be in the scanner for hours. You don't want to do multi sessions if you can avoid it. So what would happen if we increased the ISI, but we had fewer trials so that the whole experiment took the same amount of time? And we can simulate that. We can just test with fewer trials and see what will happen. And interestingly, what we see again is different patterns where if you have uh, a low density representation, then increasing the ISI actually just hurts when you limit the length of the experiment. But if you have a high density representation, then adding a couple of seconds will overall help you a lot. And so this kind of logic can really help you see how you can tweak your experiment to improve the results according to these assumptions. And there's many other analyses that we do in the paper that are in this vein. I'd encourage you to check out if you want to kind of see different ways that you can leverage the simulation to see how you can improve your results. In my final few minutes, I'm just going to talk about a different kind of benefit of fMRI sim that's related but different. I'm going to talk about how fMRI sim can be helpful for methods development, helping us figure out new ways to analyze fMRI data. The first uh, method I'm going to talk about is topological data analysis, which is an advanced new method from mathematics that uses topology to study data. And so topology is the study of geometry that's inflexible, that's flexible to uh, twisting and reshaping and changes in size. And the kind of goal of topology is basically to find loops or holes in data. That's actually a really difficult thing. When we have a data set that looks like this, just imagine like a scatter plot that produced this, this result. Our eyes immediately tell us that there are two circles here. One circle is small, one circle is large. Having a data analytic method that can tell us that same thing, it's actually really difficult. It's not trivial to find that. TDA is a method that can trivially find that kind of data, that structure in our data. So TDA is a method for extracting 
what extent loops are present in data. We thought this could be important for fMRI. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why we thought this would be important, but I'm going to show you what results we got with fMRI SIM that I think can be instructive as to how fMRI SIM can be useful for methods development. So the idea is that with uh, this method, topological data analysis, let's say there are two metrics that we want to evaluate our data on. We're going to use this method in two different ways. We've got two metrics. On the y-axis is basically how strong our effect was. And on the x-axis is how much signal we had to put into the brain. So it's how much we changed the simulation to make it a stronger result. And I'm going to show you what would happen if we have three different types of experiments that we were running with different conditions. Now, I have 18 conditions because eight, it's not conditions in the normal sense. It's like an RSA, a representational similarity analysis. And using this approach, I'm obviously skipping over a lot of details, but the critical results that I think are pretty clear are that if we use this metric, maximum persistence, then you see that there's not really a difference between the different types of conditions that you can have really any amount of conditions, you're going to get the same pattern of results. But critically, you have to have a signal change that's of a certain magnitude in order to get that pattern of results. That's what you'd get if you use this metric. But if you use a different metric, then you could find a different pattern of results such that with only 12 conditions, that green line, you need much less signal change in order to see a significant effect or to see any effect in this case. And so depending on your goals and depending on your um, how you want to use these methods, this simulation can tell you what will work and what won't work with your study. And so this is kind of this way of like vetting whether your study is going to work, or in this case, vetting whether a method is going to work. A final method I'm going to talk about is we developed a method for a distributed searchlight where it gathers information from across the brain in order to do a decoding analysis. It's, sorry, it's actually an encoding model in this case. And we had a hypothesis that like this method was really good at taking information from across the brain, but we want to verify that with a simulation. And we want to show that when information is, from, is represented across the brain, that this model would do really well and that would be represented by high values on the y-axis. And when it's really clustered, localized, this model wouldn't show an improvement over existing methods, but it wouldn't necessarily do worse either. And so we simulated data in your representation that was either distributed or localized. And indeed, we found this pattern of results that we hypothesized. So this confirmed to us that the method that we had developed was leveraging the neural representations that we thought it was leveraging. OK. So, in conclusion, I've given you a quick primer into how fMRI SIM works. I've also uh, showed you how pre-registration can be used and power analysis can be used. And I've also given you some example applications of fMRI SIM. I want to conclude by saying there is a privilege to conduct research with such a powerful and expensive piece of equipment. Because of the cost of fMRI, we owe it to our taxpayers to do research wisely. We know from multiple papers that we've talked about that there are severe problems of replicability in fMRI data. I think all of us, including myself, like I'm, I'm very aware that I am, I am part of the, this community and I am contributing to these problems. We need to take a step back before leaping into fMRI data collection and analysis. And I think simulation is a valuable way for us to do that. So thank you for listening. Thank you to the collaborators listed here, John, Chris, Mingbo, and Anna for all your help when generating fMRI SIM and also to the funding sources point you there to a link to my website where you can see the papers as well as all of the um, code and everything that was used uh, that, that is part of your So thank you. Welcome any questions. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, as we did before, just uh, book a question in the chat or raise your hand or whatever. Somehow we understand whether you can you you want to ask questions to come in. Uh, I would have uh, a question. It's more like uh, I'm trying to 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 crunch all this uh, information and and sit on it to to, to understand the, the mechanism of this uh, uh, outstanding work. What uh, I was thinking about is whether uh, at least uh, in, especially the, the the 
uh, to the latter part of the talk. Uh, is this also a way to understand uh, insights of the fMRI signal itself? So something that could be somehow related to, uh, for example, uh, the, the underpinnings, for example, metabolic underpinnings or uh, or simply the, the, the way in which the machine produced the, uh, the signal itself. So something that uh, uh, a synthetic uh, way to understand something which is actually real. Yeah, um, I think you're exactly right uh, on that assumption. It is the case that we are kind of using the existing body of knowledge about noise properties of fMRI, so for instance, physiological noise, but also like scanner noise generated by thermal activity in the scanner. And we're leveraging that information in order to design our simulation. So it's tricky for the simulation to go in reverse because the simulation is based on that. It's hard for the simulation to tell us like insights about the, the noise properties. But there was actually one thing that did happen in the progress of creating the simulation that I does it, to do actually think speaks to that. It's not like a grand insight, but it was that when we were creating the simulation, we had learned from a lot of different research that uh, background noise or just static thermal noise in the scanner is Rishian, which Rishian is a type of distribution that like has a peak very quickly and then a long tail. That's, that's the kind of idea of a Rishian distribution. And so we were simulating data in the, in, in the noise, the thermal noise uh, with this Rishian distribution. And we kept getting data that was like not compelling. It wasn't a good simulation, it was, it was inaccurate. And, what we realized was that part of the problem was that the data itself, as in like the, the kind of the template that we were using as input to the data itself was Rishian. And we were adding another Rishian distribution on top of that, that was creating this non-Rishian distribution. It was basically like creating a, a non-appropriate model of, of how this data works. And so we found that the better way to proceed was instead to uh, create a Gaussian distribution on top of that. And we don't think this is some grand insight, but it was nonetheless like something that we didn't expect about the appropriate way to do the simulation that isn't obvious or talked about in the, in the field. Really interesting, really interesting. Um, Frauke, please. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. It was really great. And um, yeah, it fitted so well, <laughs> I think. Um, I have a question about the, you talked a bit about the, the data that you should acquire and just to follow up on that, is there a minimum number of participants that, that you would that you would recommend? Because you said that one could also do it with pilots. So do you use those to extract like mean and standard deviation of, of, of noise or is it so? So is there an upper limit or recommended, recommended yeah. number? Yeah, I mean, the more participants, the better. Uh, that's always going to be the case. Um, I think it really depends on what the goal of your simulation is. But what I would recommend is that you collect, you, you get an open data set, something like um, the, the HCP data set or the ABCD data set or just some large data set. So it's got 100 participants in it. And then you subsample that study as if you're saying like, okay, here are 24 participants from that mm -hmm. study. And then you get the noise properties of that data and you then run your simulation based on those 24 participants. And then the next simulation that you run, you get another different grab of 24 participants. That to me would be like the most high fidelity simulation that you could do of like what you might expect to collect. That's gonna be limited in, for instance, let's say you're not using the scanning protocol from this big data set, or it doesn't have the population that you wanna study. And so you might have to choose to just use one or two participants. That's fine. Um, it's 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 better than nothing, certainly. But I do raise a little bit of caution because of this plot I showed here, um, which is this is seventeen participants. These are adults, and they're doing a resting state study. They're just basically asleep in the scanner. Well, they're not asleep, but they're resting in the scanner. And looking at the range of these participants, it's huge. Like the SNR from twenty to seventy. That's a huge range of SNR. And so if you just collected one participant and use that participant as your basis for your noise simulation, it's better than nothing, but you don't know where they will be on that range. And so that could be problematic for interpret over-interpreting your results. Yeah. This, this is generally a true problem about sampling in general. So like whenever we sample things, we could have an unrepresentative sample, but yeah. I think it's a could be a problem in this case. 
Yeah. But, but could you, for example, use resting state data um, for simulating also task? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Resting state is probably the best, okay. but task is fine too. Everything, any kind of fMRI data is fine because the, the signal in real fMRI data doing like a finger tapping, like the, the evoked response is like two, three yeah. percent. That's like the biggest response you could possibly get that's non-movement related in fMRI. <laughs> It's minuscule when we're thinking about the noise properties of the data. And so these noise simulations are just going to be completely oblivious to any signal that's truly in the data. So you can use task, you can use rest, doesn't matter. It's, it's okay. oblivious to that. I've, yeah. I've looked at differences within an individual for task versus rest. There is non, no differences there apparent. Yeah. Okay, yeah, interesting. Cool, thanks. <laughs> so, um... I do not see any other question in the chat. Uh, I think we could uh, like seamlessly switch to the like generic open discussion. Um, so um, feel free uh, to ask questions to our speakers uh, related to uh, the topic of the symposium in general or whatever. You can also um, address specific questions. I think that would be uh, happy to answer in any case. I guess I, I did want to raise like a discussion point, and it was related to a question that you got, Praka, about the um, about single study uh, uh, case studies. And I think I think the open science movement in general that's unfolded over the last ten years has has really made us like feel anxiety towards any study that has a low end. And I think it's important when we're thinking about power about that exact point. But I do want to speak in favor of low sample size studies. If the goal is to just do something that's never been done before and to explore something in a population that's really hard to study. And I, I, I worry about people feeling like a little put off by doing a study if they think that they're just going to be hammered at review because they don't have a big enough sample when it's just truly impossible to get a bigger sample. And I think back to, you know, case studies of HM, where it's like, this was one participant that had a very imperfect set of lesions in his hippocampus, yet we learned incre like incredible amounts of information from this one individual and studying him very intensely. And so I, I, I really see them as, and, and fMRI, like we haven't seen that many case studies of one individual being studied in depth, but we have seen some. So for instance, like the deep data collection that Ross Paul direct, went through is like an example where it's like we can gain pretty unique insights with a sample size of one or midnight scan club is like a sample size of five and so i think this is just generally something that we need to be aware of and i think that people like me shouldn't be like hard on others who have low sample size or under power of study because it sometimes is the only thing that we can do and i think we should just be okay with that Yeah, I, I also agree that, that yeah, there's something to learn from that too. And um, I guess when this whole discussion is always, yeah, it's always centered around this also larger and larger studies <laughs> that are coming up. So, I mean, it's more and more the default to have like large sample sizes. But yeah, as you say, I think it's probably just a way of framing it then and describing it not in the same way as you would describe the, the other type of study. Yeah. I so saw there's something in the chat. Ah. Um, so Marianne asked whether there's a problem to power study based on reported result. Um, yeah, there's, um, <laughs> given that there's a publication bias, um, um, you're probably not too sure that the, re that the results that are reported in the literature are really are really the, the realistic effect sizes or whether this is, um, they are due to the winner's curse. So when, when testing with low sample sizes that you would find uh, very inflated effect sizes. And then when you base your power analysis on that, you will get a very low sample size, um, but this kind of perpetuates per per the, the problem. And um, what I would recommend is to, yeah, to try to summarize the literature at least and see if there's a bias. So maybe meta if there are meta-analysis or so. Um, 
or even what I did now for a study, actually, I also, I also simulated the data. So it was not fMRI data, but generally um, some brain for some brain matters and so on. And then uh, I also found that in the literature, the, there was a really large effect size also in summarizing studies. And then I just, um, yeah, more or less randomly divided this by two <laughs> or made it like really smaller to see what would happen if this is a more realistic um, uh, effect size to, yeah, to not fall into that trap. But maybe Cameron, you want to comment? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think your answer is really great. It ran the gamut of all the considerations. I think that like, it's better than nothing, obviously. <laughs> I think that like using something for the basis of your power analysis is better than what a lot of people do, which is that they pick a round number, a divisible number, like number 24 or 32, and, and that's how many participants they, they run. I think that, uh, I mean, I be aware, like basically everything I've recommended other people should do, I have done myself in my very short career, uh, which is that like I do infant research, we just picked a number of 24 participants. It was a reasonable amount of participants to collect, and it we didn't know if it would be enough but we thought it would be enough and it's sometimes the only thing you can do because there's, there's no basis the, the the studies that we had to go off when we started were a sample size of six participants and so we're not going to do six participants we didn't think that was enough but how many is enough we don't know so it's it's really hard when you're a scientist because you're you're an explorer you're testing new things and the whole point of doing research is often to just discover something new and so it, it, it's better to have some basis on which you're publishing this, but all of those caveats that Fraka explained are exactly right. We don't always know. So uh, I would have another comment is uh, more related to, uh, to some extent uh, the, the, the reason why uh, we decided here at CIMAC to organize this symposium, which is uh, the fact that uh, here at CIMAC we have sort of like uh, um, many different methodologies available together. Uh, for example, MEG, EG, uh, brain stimulation, and um, fMRI. Uh, so um, many people, they are trying to, uh, to run studies which uh, try to take advantage of the uh, most relevant features of all the technologies and methodologies. But then uh, sometimes uh, people, they also ask me uh, whether it's possible to uh, find a way to calculate uh, power or to some extent uh, depict a general uh, um, say description of uh, such uh, complex uh, studies. And of course, I, I didn't have an answer. And I, I would try to, to ask you now whether uh, there is uh, the possibility to uh, estimate the power of uh, somehow um, something which comes uh, from different uh, sources, like very different experiments, and whether there are um, even, let's say, tricks or caveats uh, with something that uh, uh, is uh, going on somewhere. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I think a lot of people are really interested in that exact question. Like there are ongoing studies of people conducting IFNIAs while also in the scanner or EG while also in the scanner. And then you can do a simple task where it's like a vote response, visual vote response, and compare the magnitude within groups like percent signal change. That's a variable that can be compared across different modalities and see what it is across, uh, across experiments. That's complicated because, you know, these different methods will have different um, uh, abilities to detect signal that's deeper in the brain versus more superficial in the brain. And it, it just, it's a really hard problem that we, I feel like, are very far away from solving. I think your best guess is to look those studies that are comparing those two methods directly, see how comparable the signal change is. And then if you are testing something that's similar to what they tested, then I think you're, you can use the transformation and use that kind of like, this effect worked with 60% power or 80% power in EG with this number of participants, with this transformation we can figure out for fMRI. But I think it's really hard. I, I, I don't think it's, you're going to get a clear answer. Yeah, I also think that this is, yeah, increasingly increasingly common but still not i mean we can't even 
do it very well for one modality. And then um, when, I mean, and then going to, 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 to different ones that are maybe also not too well understood how they relate to one another in, in terms of or if they even <laughs> relate so directly. Um, yeah, but when, when probably it's, it would be good, as I also point out in the talk to when, when you, yeah, when you have this large project, let's say, where you have an FMI task and then maybe some simulation in the scanner and also doing um, behavioral tests or so that, that at least for the parts that, that we know or feel confident about that we present power analysis for these ones and also be honest about exploring. Um, I think it's not 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 an, not difficult. I mean, it's not a problem to to also explore because um, there's not so much prior knowledge. But it's but it's problematic to to claim later that that you had had these hypotheses about certain parameters. So this yeah, this can then also be stated in the pre-registration in a very straightforward way, and nobody will complain about it when it's yeah clear. No. Yeah. But can, can I ask something back to you, Vitalia? <laughs> um, this power analysis. Uh, so, is it is it a topic that comes up comes up often for you? So that um, it, that people ask about how to do it, or that it's because mm -hmm. I have, well, yeah, for me, I have the feeling that in our institute, it's yeah, it's more or less the way that Cameron described that people kind of say, "Ah, oh, we will measure thirty participants because." Yeah. We kind of think that this should be sufficient because it's twice as much as we did in 1995 or so. And then, um, and sometimes people present also some power analysis, but it's really still not so, not so much in, in the focus of people, I would say. Let's put it this way. Uh, I specifically work on uh, an open science initiative. Uh, so, since I think 2018, I think, uh, we had, I think this is the third or the fourth uh, uh, event we organized related to somehow pre-registration. Um, so um, I somehow, it's not so frequent, but still, uh, I receive questions related to pre-registration. And then uh, when I have to answer uh, to question related to uh, this specific topic, I'm always, uh, uh, a little bit uh, confused or uh, I don't have all the knowledge uh, uh, to, to construct a reliable answer uh, for people doing uh, uh, neuroimaging, which is uh, not the, the main core of CIMEC, but it's one of the, the most important parts of, of the research uh, uh, here at CIMEC for the reason uh, I just mentioned. So the fact that we had many the queen. So, um, I do not receive questions related to power analysis itself. Uh, I receive questions related to pre-registration and most of the time I cannot answer in a proper way uh, when it's, uh, um, it's about uh, uh, calculating the effect size for fMRI, so that specific step of the, of the pre-registration. Um, that's why uh, I wanted to, to organize something to, to at least uh, uh, gather people uh, talking about this. Um, I think uh, that uh, uh, in any case, this could be what's another thing to discuss. Um, I think that uh, here uh, there are, so <clears throat> I, I would just mention that yesterday um, within this Italian Reproducibility Network Initiative, um, we had um, an interesting talk uh, uh, by Brian Nozick, um, who actually uh, tried to, to insert this layer of uh, between, let's say, infrastructures and practices and, uh, like, let's say, more theoretical research. There was this layer between the two, which was the community, let's say, so that this kind of gray space where people uh, start adopting things, uh, start uh, discussing in front of the coffee machine or in a, in a Zoom. Uh, um, in a Zoom session. Um, so I think that here we are in a, in a sort of, in a moment where uh, all these open science uh, tools that uh, uh, an initiative like the one 
uh, working on um, are trying to disseminate, for example, per registration and all the other things you can think about. Uh, we are just uh, uh, trying to trigger this kind of uh, uh, practices and discussions in order to, and this is something that I think emerged from your talks as well, uh, to improve the way in which uh, uh, people do si science in general. It's not even, uh, let's say, the, the over objective uh, is kind of like, uh, uh, it's going to disappear um, once uh, a technique or a practice is adopted uh, widely, let's say. And that's, I think, uh, of course, there are people that are not interested in, uh, in pre-registration or in power analysis uh, specifically, uh, but uh, if there is, I think, a community or events uh, where people talk about this, uh, um, these practices and within these events, so within this community talk, uh, if uh, somehow emerges the fact that uh, uh, adopting open science practices improve uh, the actual value of science, then maybe uh, in, that's, that's a, an interesting way to, uh, let's say, uh, push and disseminate uh, uh, this kind of uh, also difficult and hard to to um, hard to manipulate techniques, and and that's I think maybe another point uh, we could uh, quickly discuss before uh, calling it um, um, calling it a day. Uh, maybe I really like the fact that uh, uh, there is also that there is always um, this mentioning of uh, you know, there is tons of open data right there. You can grab that data and use it for your purposes. So um, as far as I understood, and that's what um, I'm asking you, um, it's something like uh, open science tools and uh, let's say uh, data are not completely tools, but, but still open, open science uh, uh, facilities, they're going uh, to play um, a, a crucial role in improving science itself. So um, I'm asking whether uh, the presence of, of these tools uh, or facilities and the diffusion of these tools uh, is going to shape up uh, uh, scientific practices uh, uh, in the next years, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I, I hope so. Um, I, I hope that the current generation of scientists are different than the previous one in the sense that we are trying to be more open about our results. I think it's, it's now probably the case that like 20 or 30% of studies will publicly release their data, be it neuroimaging, behavioral, what have you, which is massively improved from every single study 10 years ago saying a contact the author for data um and i think until people do it they don't realize how easy it is to to publicly release your data and publicly release your code it's the kind of thing that you should like the the data release is like an exercise of you checking your code is organized in a way that's like sensible and it will help you find errors like i once found the age was wrong and one of my participants just before I set it out to send out to authors, sorry, send out to review because I was about to send it out to, um, to be released publicly as well. And that exercise helped me make my science better because I had to go through my data and, and check all those things and thankfully nothing changed, but it was like a, an important thing for me to discover. Uh, and the same with code is that like we code in, in unhygienic ways when we're analyzing things, things will just get messy. And that isn't good for making sure the code is doing what we want it to do. So the exercise of making a, a publicly releasable thing is also good for you making sure that your code is doing what you want it to do. And so these practices are good for us. And I really encourage other people to adopt it. It does take time, but I think one of the really important things that we as scientists should be doing that we aren't yet doing is rewarding people who do take that time is that like we don't elevate individuals who spend the time to make a Jupyter notebook that clearly walks through their results and is repro machine reproducible. I think all of those things should be rewarded more so than they are today in science. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I, just a comment on the, there was a comment in the chat saying that sharing data is not sustainable. So 
Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I also face that problem a lot. Um, but um, for me, or at least in our institute, the conclusion is a bit that um, we at least share um, summary data. So this should always be possible. And this, so as we heard today and several examples can also be useful already to, to have, for example, statistical maps then published. And, and also when, yeah, it, it depends of course on the populations you're looking at, but you can also modify your consent forms in a way that, that you can share the data with some restrictions and um, yeah, I, th I think it's, yeah, <laughs> of course, it's, it's a long way to go. And um, I would also say that in my, in my feeling, then um, open science practices are more and more rewarded in a way that, um, that also institutions look at your, not only at the highest impact paper you've ever published, but also look into how, how your open science record what it looks like, whether you have a GitHub page with, with your code and whether you have no, some projects on the OSF. And also I think slowly it also, yeah, reaches through that somehow, for example, publishing preprints or having pre-registered studies is just better in the long run. But I feel that is really, um, that's really a um, generational thing maybe. Or, and even, uh, and also thing that, that um, yeah, the, the people who are in the positions of yeah, power, but <laughs> the faculty leading positions also right now, they have, they have worked differently to come there. And now as uh, young researchers, we have to kind of have to do both <laughs> in a way to be open and this costs time and this is not yet as rewarded as it should be. But I'll definitely agree with Cameron on that. Yeah, just quickly. I, sorry, yes, I was uh, talking in my very American-centric way that there are no rules in other than what our <laughs> IRB allows us to do and our IRB allows us to do lots of things. Uh, so yes, I am aware of that, but I do, I think we as researchers benefit the most from the summary results, more so than the raw data, except in the rare cases of like a huge data set like uh, HCP or ABCD. So I think that is a really useful first step is just re releasing the summary results and basically making it accessible so that anyone can re replicate the figures that you created. I think that's a great first step. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Cassandra wants to, to uh, discuss about this. I would uh, um, share my, my take on, on this specific topic because um, well, let's say it's, uh, it's something that uh, uh, relates to my, let's say, everyday uh, job uh, a lot. So the fact that here in Europe uh, it's not that straightforward to share data. Um, either way, uh, from, uh, let's say, the context we were discussing now, so the fact that uh, um, open science practices, they trigger somehow, um, let's say, uh, way, new ways to improve your everyday job, uh, in any case, um, prepare the data for sharing and share the data with, that's the joke I always used to say, uh, prepare the data to share uh, for uh, yourself in, uh, let's say, 10 months or, or 10 minutes. Sometimes it's already, it's an open science practice, which uh, crucially improved the way in which uh, you, you do your everyday job. So. Um, of course, I think uh, uh, Europe is nowadays somehow, um, I'm not saying it's losing a train, but still uh, uh, something uh, like, I don't know, NARPS, for example, NA, EPS, they study uh, 70 groups and so on. Uh, it happened because it was straightforward to circulate this data uh, throughout uh, uh, researchers. Uh, that never seen themselves and maybe they would they will never in their lives uh, and the fact that uh, maybe this it's not uh, so straightforward to build in Europe on the fly maybe right now if someone has this idea I think it's not uh, that good for for the movement itself uh, uh, in Europe that would be my take but I don't know if, if uh, Cassandra wants to uh, to say something more hi yeah, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Victoria, for suggesting I was sort of 
working on other things and I heard this oh data sharing is easy and so I'm so I'm um my role is the open science community engagement coordinator at the Wellcome Centre at Oxford University and um I, I every day people ask me how when can they share their data and uh, they're ready to do it and and I have to be the unfortunate bearer of news that we're going through a significant amount of work with contracts departments and ethics and governance and privacy and then on top of that the UK is about to was considering changing our GDPR regulations to diverge from Europe which will make things even more complicated um but we're not we I I, I think it's a really interesting point Victoria that projects like NARPS and other things um, may have only been made possible because of data sharing and we need to be able to have common access to something in order to find the variance in the way we work. Um, but we, we do recognise it's a problem and I, I, I think as well that we are a step behind what's possible in the US because we're spending so much energy on addressing this problem of how do we let our universities let us share our data. Um, one thing that I thought it, I've always found as an interesting possibility around simulating data is how that could maybe help us get around the privacy issues. So if, if rather than sharing our actual data, what if we can recreate our entire data set with just a simulation, then it's, we don't have to consider the privacy of the, the participants that we actually used and we're just sharing a simulation of the data that matches all properties of our actual data and then we shouldn't have um we sort of circumvent all those privacy issues so i don't know i i think that we're not going to have to get to that point um but i, I think it's a it's a I'm, I'm really pleased to have seen both these presentations i think it's great that these are these are issues that i have been difficult as, far, as long as I've known about like open science, I first, how do we pre-register these things in a way that protects the freedom of our exploratory analysis? And how do we, how do we make anything that's close to a simulation? It breaks my heart when simulated day, behavioral data, like here, randomly generate some data. It's not quite as easy for us. So sorry, bit of a, bit of a rant, but I'm, I'm grateful for the work and I really appreciate the, the opportunity to hear from you both and, and, and take part in this session. Thank you for, for this comment, Cassandra. I don't know if you have uh, something to add. Um, yeah, I just posted, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. just posted this, this package that allows you to generate synthesized data sets for, yeah, for example, for behavioral data and NR, and it's pretty nice. But I think for FMI data, then probably we would need an extension of the FMI SIM package to do that. And but yeah, maybe maybe it could be possible somehow. Yeah, I mean, if I SIM could do it, it it it's it's possible. I I think it would be a good step in the right direction. I also just posted a paper of um from Vanden and colleagues that was po uh, published, I think this year, maybe last year, uh, where they are completely aware of this problem and they thought of like an imputation style method where they're basically like interpolating data, that they're leaving out some data and interpolating it and then iterating over that so that there's no real data left in their data set. It's all fake, but it's got the exact same descriptive statistics as the original data. And so that's what the, that paper is about. So that's an alternative method you could use that isn't about like fully simulating your data, but it is about like being able to release a data set that will be at least useful for some purposes. Uh, I would just add uh, a very quick comment about this. I think uh, it's very interesting. Uh, um, a free solution to discuss, uh, let's say, a thought provoking uh practice this kind of like uh, let's recreate um uh, what we did or let's um, synthesize synthesize let's say what we did um let's say that uh, in any case this should not let's say uh, exclude the very quick discussion we have 
the very early stages of this generic uh, of this discussion panel related to let's say single participant studies or extreme cases which uh, let's say have very few uh, let's say the sample size is very low one two people uh, and so on and so forth but they are full of information uh, so uh, even if I really like this uh, this interesting. Uh, uh synthesization synthetization of of, uh, of the data i think in any case we should uh, uh, put on the table the point that uh, uh, data should circulate in order to unleash these kind of powers or uh, these kind of features uh, on uh, this kind of uh, i'm calling it extreme data sets let's say one participant or whatever but maybe uh, you could find a, a a different and more uh, appropriate name, uh, let's say. So let, let's let's not forget uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, data themselves should uh, circulate. And I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, there should be uh, something really relevant in those, uh, let's say, single case uh, studies uh, to be open and presented to the community in some way. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, you should share raw data. Maybe it's very really relevant. Uh, because it's hard to uh, then recreate the conditions uh, to analyze them, but I think uh, it, it would be worth uh, thinking at, at least or discussing a way uh, to uh, to present to the community this kind of uh, uh, sources of information. Maybe uh, finding a sort of uh, way to uh, simulate something which is uh, which uh, carries the relevant features of the single studies as, uh, as well. 